to the first distinguished lecture this semester. Uh, this has been made possible due to the combined efforts of the Vice Chancellor who escorted her last evening, Dean Academic Planning who was initially in touch with her, uh, Abhiram, Ambika, these are the people who actually made this happen and I'm sure you would really enjoy this. Uh, the inaugural distinguished lecture of this semester. Uh, very briefly, I would like to uh, tell you about the talk a little bit and also about uh, the speaker. Uh, primarily, we are, there is a growing interest in expanding use of biofuels for transportation to reduce dependence on imports, to expand markets for agricultural products, and mitigate climate change. However, there are also concerns about biofuels competing for land with food crops and irrigation water and its implication for food prices. India has set policy goals for 10% blends of ethanol from sugarcane. This presentation <coughs> will discuss the options for expanding ethanol production in India and the policies that are needed to achieve ethanol blend targets as well as its economic implications for agricultural and transportation sectors. We will also describe policy approaches taken by two leading producers of biofuels, Brazil and the United States, to significantly expand biofuel production and the extent to which these have been successful. The distributional effects of these policies and the lessons for policy that can be drawn from India will be discussed. Uh, Professor Madhu Khanna is the ACES Distinguished Professor of Environmental Economics in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Her research examines the incentives for clean technology adoption, the economic and environmental effects of biofuels, and the effectiveness of environmental policies. She was selected as a University of Illinois Scholar, a Leopold Leadership Fellow of the Woods Institute at Stanford University, and received the Paul A. Funk recognition from the College of ACES. She serves on the Science Advisory Board of the US EPA, and is currently the editor of the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. So, you can imagine we have someone who is much more interdisciplinary in nature, has very deep insights on uh, sustainable energy. Uh, so, without anything much, I think people are waiting. Please, ma'am. Well, uh, so not, uh, and all the faculty uh, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today. This is my first visit to Nalanda, and. Uh, I had the opportunity this morning to visit the ruins um, and it's of course truly impressive to see what we had accomplished you know, more than a thousand years ago. Uh, but uh, I've been involved with um, uh, you know, talks with uh, Professor Samarwal and uh, Professor Sharma, who's the academic dean, uh, even before, for more than a year and, and uh, I could not imagine that uh, you know, they would be able to accomplish so much in such a short time. Uh, just a year, what's been accomplished here is just amazing. Uh, and you know, I can see that you know, all of you sitting here are real pioneers in uh, you know, uh, working so hard to make, uh, to rebuild Nalanda and I can just uh, imagine what it will look like in two years. So, um, you know, so really, you know, would like to wish you all the best and um, I hope you feel really proud of the effort that you're doing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, my work. Uh, I've been working on this topic of biofuels for about seven or eight years uh, now and uh, most of my work is focused on the U.S. But I've also looked at uh, what has been happening in, in India and in Brazil and I thought this would be a really good opportunity to try to pull all of that together and see what can we really draw in terms of what are some of the common uh, themes and what kind of lessons one can learn from, uh, from what has been accomplished in, in the US uh, and Brazil. 
So, um, you know, as someone I just mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of interest in biofuels in the last, uh, you know, five or six years, um, and a big motivation has been for all of the uh, uh, all of these countries has been that they're highly dependent on on oil and imported oil, and so that so in order to reduce that dependence, they've been looking for some renewable domestic sources of energy that they can control. Uh, so a major reason has been this energy security aspect of it. Um, a secondary reason is, of course, concerns about climate change. And the transportation sector is now increasingly becoming the dominant sector responsible for carbon emissions. It used to be the electricity sector. But the elect for electricity, we have many uh, new options, wind and solar and so on, that are now emerging and becoming competitive. But in the case of transportation, we have very few choices because we need a liquid fuel. And although there is electric vehicles, there is natural gas, but uh, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the vehicles in order to use it. So biofuels offers a really practical alternative because it's a liquid fuel, it's renewable, low carbon, and it can be used with the current uh, technology. Uh, a third reason has been uh, you know, to stimulate rural economic development. And in every country around the world, agriculture is really an important sector. And the agricultural lobby is always very important. And so um, you know, as prices of agricultural commodities decline over time, uh, there is increasing pressure to find new high-valued uses for those commodities. And so biofuels offers this opportunity where you can make these commodities like corn and sugarcane now be linked to the price of oil. And as the price of oil rises, the value of these commodities will also rise, and so this offers a great opportunity to, to increase rural incomes. So um, as a result of all of this, and you know, uh, the last uh, two decades, uh, countries have invested a lot in building uh, biofuel technologies and infrastructure. And as you can see from this graph, uh, production has grown more than sixfold um, you know, in, in particularly two major countries, uh, Brazil and U.S., and to some extent the European Union, uh, and uh, followed uh, by uh, the European Union, uh, by China a little bit, but uh, primarily it's the U.S. And, and Brazil which are leading, uh, you know, in terms of production. India, uh, just to give you a sense of perspective, out of the 120 uh, million liter, billion liters that were produced in 2015, India's production was about half a billion liters. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a relatively small uh, producer at the moment. Um, just a little background in terms of the types of biofuels, and it's important to recognize that there are, in fact, many different types, and that's you know, increasingly becoming very important to, to take, keep in mind. Um, but the simplest process for producing biofuel is really from sugar cane. So sugar cane is already a, uh, you know, you just take the sugar, you ferment it, and you can make alcohol out of it, and with some little more process, it becomes something you can drive your cars with. So that's the easiest uh, process, and, and um, it's being used by Brazil. It's a, Brazil's production is entirely based on sugar cane. Uh, in the U.S., they started, they don't have sugar cane. They started producing it from corn. Corn requires some additional process, a pre-process to convert the starch in the corn into sugar, and then once you have the sugar, it's very similar to sugar cane, and you can use, you know, produce ethanol out of it. Um, the latest that is now being, uh, you know, technology that is now being worked on is the cellulosic biofuels, and cellulosic biofuels can be produced from uh, well, basically a biomass, any type of biomass, so grasses or wood. Um, you know, uh, even solid waste. All of this, anything that has biomass uh, has uh, cellulose in it, and cellulose can be converted into glucose, and glucose can be converted into sugar, and so on. So it requires an additional, you know, pre-processing even more than, than corn. Um, but the big advantage of cellulosic biofuels is that you don't have to use food crops. And so the, the concern has been that as, as U.S. and Brazil have expanded production of, of sugarcane and corn ethanol, they've diverted a large part of their production to this, and that's reduced the amount available for food, and that's raised food prices. And so the, uh, you know, it's not considered to be very sustainable you know, to really increase production a lot in the future. Um, and so the cellulosic biofuels offers this opportunity where you can use very low quality land to grow biomass from a variety of different types of grasses.
that are very productive and convert that into fuel. But that's still a technology that's just emerging. And, um, you know, and a lot of my work is actually focused on looking at the economics of the second generation biofuels. Um, So uh, this just shows that biofuels, you know, in order to increase the production, you need policy. It's not going to happen by itself. You cannot leave it to the market forces to let to, to increase production of biofuels. And a major, a simple reason for that is that biofuels are very costly to produce right now uh, and have been. And so, if it weren't for policy, nobody would want to consume it. You could not get produce. Uh, you know, if you drive your car, you're not going to buy a more expensive fuel for your car when a cheaper gasoline is available. Right? So, uh, in order to, to force consumers to consume it, you need to have some kind of a government policy in order to do that. And so, worldwide, I mean, currently about 64 countries in the world have biofuel policies, which are mainly in the form of mandates. And so, they are requiring that the oil producers blend a certain percentage of biofuel in with their gasoline before they sell it, or with the diesel before they sell it. Uh, and so, uh, as you can see, these are the countries that have these policies, anything ranging from 5% to 20% blends. India is one of the countries that has also had a policy for the last 10 years, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, in addition to mandates, many countries have also offered subsidies for, uh, for their oil producers to blend it, or they provide tax credits. Uh, they put import tariffs because, like, the U.S. does not want, uh, you know, to import sugarcane ethanol from Brazil. Instead, they want to encourage their own domestic industry. So there's a lot of effort in order to encourage domestic production uh, of biofuels across the world. So let me just sort of talk briefly about how biofuel expansion took place in Brazil and what were some of, what are some of the consequences of that. So this uh, sort of graph on the right basically shows the um, you know the, the black line is or is um, shows the amount of uh, ethanol consumption over time and the red line is the amount of gasoline consumption in Brazil since 2003. So this is sort of the last 10 years, um, and then the uh, purple bars are the, are the sales of flex fuel cars. So flex fuel cars are cars that can run on any blend of gasoline and biofuel. Uh, normally, most cars are uh, able to use 10% blend without any problem, but if you want to go more than 10%, you need to have the special engine that can run with that. And so in addition to biofuels, you need the cars that can use that, that fuel. And as you can see, that the production of, of ethanol from sugarcane in Brazil, the black line, you know, grew really rapidly till about 2008. So, so until about 2008, Brazil was the biggest producer of biofuel in the world. And by 2008, the share of biofuels and gasoline in Brazil had become equal. So biofuels had a 50% share of the fuel market. Uh, since then, biofuel production has actually stagnated and even declined a little bit while gasoline production has increased again. And that's a little bit of a reversal of you know, what, has, uh, what you would expect. And, and so we'll talk a little bit about what led to that change. Um, but um, essentially, you know, Brazil was the leading uh, success story when it came to biofuels because not only were they able to ramp up production very rapidly, they were able to increase the, uh, you know, uh, uh, consumers, they were able to induce consumers to buy flex fuel cars. They changed the whole car technology so that they could use 50% or more blends of, of biofuel. So in Brazil, what the policy, what they have is they have two types of biofuel, yeah, or fuel. One is this blended fuel, that, which is already pre-blended with, uh, you know, biofuel blended with gasoline, like 25%. So, so you cannot buy clear, plain gasoline anymore. You buy this blended fuel that, that's part of the mandate that you have to blend 20 to 25%. And in addition to that, you can also buy pure ethanol, that's 100% ethanol. And so consumers with flex fuel cars can drive up to the gas station and then they can see which one is cheaper, whether it's better to buy the blended fuel or whether to buy 100% gas uh, ethanol. And based on that, they can make the best choice. And, and so there's complete substitutability between the uh, blended fuel and the pure ethanol. Um, now, one of the things about Brazil is that they have a lot of land. So, and, and a lot of their land is not cultivated. 
only 20% of the total arable land is actually cultivated. And they've got a vast amount of land which is in, currently in like a degraded pasture production. And that has a potential to be upgraded and used for crop production. So in the case of Brazil, there's no shortage of land, unlike in, say, in the case of India, where there is a big pressure on, on land. So, so for them, expanding production has been relatively uh, painless. Uh, now, they did a couple of things in order to encourage the biofuel industry. One was they put this mandate. They required a blend of anything from 18 to 25 percent of biofuel with gasoline. In addition to that, they also raised the price of gasoline. They put an over 100 percent tax on gasoline. And that's similar to what we have in India. I mean, in India, too, we have a more than 100 percent tax over the wholesale price of gasoline. So that's very similar. But in addition to that, they gave a tax credit for, uh, for biofuel. So biofuel don't have to pay the same tax, the excise tax on the VAT like gasoline. So that makes it that easier for biofuels to compete with gasoline. Um, now, the, the other third policy which they did, which was that they fixed, and that's similar to what India has been doing, although recently there's been a change, was that they uh, have fixed the domestic, the government fixes the domestic price, the wholesale price of gasoline, and, um, and so uh, implicitly, you know, that sub they subsidize the price below the world market price of gasoline. And that's similar to, again, what, what we have been doing here. We have, you know, we, our wholesale price of gasoline has been below the world market price, leading to losses for our wholesale oil producing, producing companies, uh, although you know, recently we have not deregulated it. But that's sort of been what the main policy approaches that they have used. And uh, as you can see over here, the green line is the Brazilian domestic wholesale price of gasoline, and the red line is the world price. So the world price fluctuates, but the, the wholesale domestic price stays constant. And this is a way to, to you know, control uh, inflation. Uh, since about 2010, when, the, when gasoline prices shot up, the, the domestic price did not increase very much. And so there was an increasing gap, a lot of losses for their oil producer, which is also a, a state-owned oil producer like India. So that's sort of on the gasoline side. On the ethanol side, you can see the red and the green lines are the prices of the anhydrous ethanol blended with gasoline and the 100% ethanol. And again, those prices are typically higher than the wholesale price of gasoline if you look at it on an energy equivalent basis. So ethanol has only got two thirds of the energy of gasoline. So uh, if you compare on an energy equivalent basis, ethanol is more expensive to produce than gasoline. And that's why you need to have a policy because otherwise nobody is going to go and consume it. And that's why they have the mandate and the taxes and so on. And once you put those taxes and mandates, the prices become roughly equal. So on the left is the gasoline, which is the wholesale price plus the marketing and then margins and then the, the taxes. So that's the retail price to say about 367 a liter. Uh, and in the case of both anhydrous and hydrous, the cost is very high, the, the light green portion are very high because the wholesale cost of production is high, but then the taxes are much lower. And so at the end of it, on, you know, per liter, the costs are roughly equal. And so that's why uh, you know, they've been able to promote production and consumption. And you can see that over time, in the last 10 years, the trend in those prices. So the bottom is the wholesale price of uh, gasoline and ethanol, and the top lines are the retail prices of the consumers at the gas station of hydrogen and, and um, gasoline. And for most of the part, until say about 2010, in general, ethanol was uh, typically cheaper than gasoline, which is why the consumption soared and people bought the flex fuel cars and there was a you know, boom in the biofuel industry. Since 2010, the uh, price of gasoline, um, you know, because it stayed pretty fixed, it, it, the, uh, uh, it, it, you know, the biofuels were no longer as competitive with gasoline. And so, in fact, you can see that uh, you know, the, the price of gasoline and the price of biofuels have roughly been equal. And people have, in fact, at times, gasoline has been cheaper. And that is why there's been a switch back to gasoline. And there's been a reduction in the consumption of ethanol and an increase in the consumption of gasoline. So this policy that the government had, which was to keep the wholesale price of gasoline fixed while uh, the, the world price was increasing, the cost of production was increasing, actually has worked against increasing consumption of uh, ethanol because it made ethanol uh, less competitive with gasoline in the long run. 
So what was the, you know, in general, what happened as a result of this uh, policy ex uh, experiment? For one thing, uh, because of this uh, push by the government, there was a lot of, um, you know, technological improvement in the industry. And so the cost of ethanol production came down by more than 70%. And a lot of this has to do with something called learning by doing. So as you produce more and you gain experience, the costs come down, you become more efficient and better at doing it. And, and so you know, some of our work sort of shows that these costs have come down because of increased experience. So that's one of the advantages of having policy, because that forces technological development. Um, a second improved, big change was that Brazil had been an importer of oil until, you know, all through in a major importer in the 1970s and hurt by the oil prices and so on. Um, in about 2008-9, they also discovered huge uh, stocks of oil. And so partly because of that and partly because of this biofuel consumption, they are now an exporter, a small exporter of oil. So they've reduced their dependence on imports and become an exporter. Um, a third major benefit was the fuel sector, you know, I showed you the, the big tax on fuel. And over time, fuel in the sector has been a big source of tax revenue for the government. So through all of this uh, exercise actually led to a big increase in tax revenue to the government. So if you look at the distributional effect, and I actually have a paper on this, so I'm happy to send that to you if you're interested. Uh, you know, we looked at who gains and who loses from biofuel policies in Brazil, and what we found is that the policy did lead to a huge increase in the price of, of fuel, as I showed you. I mean, compared to the, the wholesale price, uh, because of the taxes and, uh, all, and the mandate, the price was is over 100% higher than it would have been, and so that's a big loss for consumers. Um, they're paying for that. Uh, also, because uh, sugar was being diverted, or sugar cane was being diverted from, sh from sugar production to biofuel production, that meant the sugar prices are higher than they would have been otherwise. So sugar consumers also pay for, for the biofuel policy. Uh, at the same time, the oil producers are being forced to blend a high-cost biofuel instead of just using their uh, lower-cost gasoline. So it's like paying a tax on gasoline. It's an implicit tax on gasoline. Uh, in addition to the 100% tax that the government also has. And so there's lower profits for the oil producers. But the big uh, winners in this is really the sugarcane producers. So it's ultimately the benefits of all of this go to the, the sugarcane industry and the land that is being used to produce the sugarcane. So it's, it's a transfer of, of uh, surplus from consumers to, uh, to particularly the, the sugarcane producers. Now, off late, as I said, I mean, production uh, has been declining because of their, their policy. This cap that they had on oil price has reduced the competitiveness of, yes, of ethanol, and so they've, they've had to change that policy, and also there have been now other internal economic problems in Brazil. Uh, the other advantage of sugarcane ethanol is that the bagasse, you know, that's, that's the stock of the sugarcane that's left over after you've taken out the juice, uh, is, a, is a great way to produce electricity. It can be burned to produce electricity that can be then used to displace the grid electricity. So not only are you producing fuel, but you're also producing co-generating electricity with it, which is also renewable. And, um, and so that's another major advantage, and Brazil's been able to do quite a bit of that. Uh, now there's been, actually, there, they have uh, two uh, new refineries in Brazil that have just set up last year that are using the bagasse, which is like a biomass, and they're using that to produce ethanol. So if you do that, you can double your yield of ethanol, not only from the sugarcane juice, but also from the bagasse that is there. So, uh, so that's you know, another major advantage and a new development. Okay. Um, now, in contrast, in the US, they followed a slightly different policy approach. They, they had a quantity mandate. They said, we want, you know, by 2022, the goal was to have 22 billion, uh, sorry, 36 billion lead, uh, gallons of biofuel being blended with uh, gasoline. So starting from pretty much, you know, very low levels, the idea was to ramp up biofuel production of uh, and of four different types. So there was, you know, corn ethanol, and then these advanced biofuels that could be produced like biodiesel or you know imported sugarcane ethanol, uh, and then um, renewable diesel, which could be produced from biomass and then cellulosic biofuels. 
So they had different quantity targets. You know, the, the corn ethanol could go up to a maximum of 15 billion gallons, and then about 4, billion, four to 5 billion gallons of the advanced and renewable, and then 16 billion gallons of cellulosic biofuels would have been produced. Uh, they haven't, you know, we've reached, we are producing close to 15 billion gallons, or about 14 billion gallons right now of corn ethanol and some amount of soybean diesel and other types of biodiesel. Um, the production of zeolosic biofuels has not kept up to pace to what was expected because the technology has not developed to that level, but it's, it's developing. So there are now three new refineries that are producing uh, cellulosic biofuels and uh, that could you know, go, and go up in the future, but there are uh, so both some policy as well as technology challenges to be overcome there. Um, in addition to the mandate, there was, there's been a you know, tax credit, a subsidy that's been given to corn ethanol. Uh, there, as I said, there's an import tariff to keep the domestic industry as opposed to importing from Brazil. Um, now the consequences of this 15 billion gallon of corn ethanol has been that a little less than half of the corn being produced in the U.S. is being diverted to uh, biofuel production. So there's been a lot of controversy about you know, how you've, you're taking food away from hungry and putting it in your car and you know, it's, it's uh, how much of, you know, it's, it's led to an increase in food prices. In 2008, if you remember, there was a, a spike in food prices, uh, corn prices, or, you know, all crops really, and, uh, and it was believed that that was because of the ramp up in corn ethanol production in Brazil. Um, now there was, of course, biofuels do uh, make the uh, price of crop, you know, crops go up, uh, and there's been a number of studies looking at the extent to which uh, the increase in food prices is due to biofuels, and the number varies across different studies. But at least 20 to 30 percent of the increase in prices was because of biofuels. So, so undoubtedly, biofuels do contribute, or at least crop-based biofuels lead to an increase in, in prices. And so that's led to this, you know, attention towards cellulosic biofuels, which are not based on crops, food crops. They're based on these grasses and so on. Um, and uh, you know, and so that's uh, uh, sort of an emerging technology. Uh, biofuels in, in 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 US too are sold either as a pre-blended fuel. You get it with a 10% blend when you go to the gas station. Or you can get something called E85, which is a 85% blend of, of biofuel with gasoline. And uh, now that can only be used with flex fuel cars. And unlike in Brazil, um, you know, Brazil was able to uh, mandate, I mean, they had a dictatorship in 2000, 2003, because of which they were able to force uh, consumers to purchase flex fuel cars. In the U.S., you cannot do that, and um, there's been little incentive for consumers to purchase flex fuel cars. So, so now we've reached a situation where we've reached a close to a 10% blend, which can be used with conventional vehicles, and uh, further expansion of biofuels is limited by, because demand for E85 is limited. And so unless there's a major shift away from conventional to flex fuel cars in the U.S., uh, you know, even if we are able to produce more cellulosic biofuels, we cannot consume it. So that's the uh, dilemma that, that the U.S. is facing. So uh, what would happen in the U.S.? Well, again, the corn ethanol technology has become rapidly, uh, you know, costs have come down quite a bit. Uh, in fact, if the, before the crash in the oil prices, uh, the you know, corn ethanol had become competitive with gasoline. So if gasoline is at 80 or $100 a barrel, uh, you really don't need a mandate anymore. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that was because the, the improvements in technology have taken place. Uh, but at the same time, there's been an expansion of corn production to meet this mandate. Um, there's been a shift away from other crops. Uh, price of corn has become linked to the price of oil. So if the price of oil goes up, the price of corn is going to go up. And um, you know that's obviously a, a disadvantage to consumers. Uh, but, it, but for the U.S., because the U.S. is a big exporter, it's, it's one of the largest exporters of corn and soybeans in the world. And uh, when the U prices go up in the U.S., they go up in the rest of the world. And so, um, so this, it's contributed to a global increase in crop prices for all the related crops. Um, and at the same time, because it's you know it's increasing, it's also a major importer of gasoline. And so like a 25% share of the world's production of gasoline is, is being imported and consumed in the U.S. 
So um, when the U.S. produces 15 billion gallons of uh, ethanol, it displaces demand in the world for gasoline, and that contributes potentially to some decline in the world prices. So not the entire decline that you've seen, but you know that does lead to some reduction in pressure in the world market. Uh, so as for the U.S. In, in general, this has been good because their exports are more valued now. The price of their exports has gone up. The price of their imports has gone down. And so the net result has been that it's a net economic benefit uh, for the U.S. economy. Okay? It's a, it has a negative impact on the consumers of agricultural commodities, both domestically and internationally. Um, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe a small benefit to the fuel consumers because the price of gasoline has gone down a little bit. Um, but the big benefic beneficiaries, again, out of this whole process has been the agricultural producers, um, you know, primarily in the corn producing uh, countries. And so the U.S. corn producers have benefited a lot. The land values, you know, skyrocketed. And uh, profits for the refineries and the agricultural producers were, uh, were huge. Um, a negative impact on the global oil producers. So, uh, you know, so in, in general, the benefits of these policies are clearly for agriculture, to some extent, perhaps for fuel consumers, although it's a little bit questionable whether that is the case or not. Um, and, um, and in the case of uh, the U.S., there's been an overall economic benefit for that. Uh, so, of course, as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the, uh, one of the motivations was uh, the environmental effects. And so what has been the benefit from an environmental perspective? Uh, here, it's become important to uh, look at the differences across these different types of biofuels. So, uh, you know, corn ethanol reduces greenhouse gas intensity by, by about 20, 30 percent. So it's not a huge amount, of, you know. Sugarcane ethanol is better. It's less carbon intensive. <coughs> And so it reduces emissions by about 60% or so. Uh, Semi-toxic biofuels are, are the best because they have a negative carbon intensity. And the reason for that is that these grasses that I was telling you about, they have, they're able to sequester a lot of carbon in the soil. Uh, and, you know, and so uh, they, can, they are like a sink for carbon. So that's a, a you know, huge advantage of growing those types of crops. Okay. Uh, but that's sort of the direct benefit of, uh, of growing these types of, you know, of producing um, these different types of biofuels. The big controversy has really been with biofuels that even though they can lead to some savings because you are displacing a gallon, a liter of gasoline with a liter of ethanol, but uh, they lead to something called indirect land use change. So, so basically what that is is that when the U.S. produces corn ethanol, it raises the price of corn, and so other countries, you know, like China or India or Brazil, start producing more corn or more crops in general, and they start expanding crop land. And when they expand crop land, they start, you know, to lead to deforestation or uh, conversion of, you know, these grasslands and so on. All of which have got carbon stored in them. So when you deforest, you're releasing carbon in the atmosphere, and that indirect effect. Uh, can more than offset the direct benefits of biofuels. So, uh, so there's been uh, you know a number of papers that have said well biofuels can in fact be worse than gasoline because of this indirect effect. Uh, again, that's a bit of an exaggeration because uh, what's you know the effect is there, but a lot of the recent literature basically says the effect is much smaller than the initial you know hype had suggested. But nevertheless, that's something that one has to keep in mind. Um, a second, uh, you know, uh, adverse effect actually of biofuels production in the U.S. is that it's led to this expansion of corn production. Corn uses a lot of nitrogen. It's a very nitrogen-intensive crop, and so this has a, has a negative impact on water quality because a lot of the nitrogen runs off and contaminates the rivers and the groundwater and so on. Uh, and there again, you know, cellulosic biofuels are better because they, again, their root system is such that they absorb and they capture the nitrogen and they prevent erosion and runoff. And, and so, cellulosic biofuels can both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve water quality. Um, you know, but again, as I said, there are challenges to uh, their uh, expansion. 
So what are some of the major things we can you know, take away from uh, this experience? One is, the first one is that, that in order to encourage production, you need binding mandates. You have to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, make sure that the oil producers are complying with it. That no matter what, whatever the cost is, they have to blend. Okay? And that was done both in, in the US as well as in, um, in Brazil, the penalties if you don't do it. Uh, the second thing is that you need a really long-term policy commitment. So it's taken, you know, 10 years or, or so for the U.S. and you can see for Brazil, you know, over 20 years to try to get to where they are. This is not something that can be done very quickly. It needs a very long-term commitment. And in part, it's because there's a significant investment that's involved. It's not just producing the corn and the sugar cane. The type of investment that's needed to set up the refineries that are going to produce it uh, the infrastructure to transport the uh, ethanol, you know, in, it's in the U.S., in Brazil, it's really being done by trucks, um, and Brazil, to some extent, by pipeline. So you need infrastructure, and for that investment, the investors have to have some guarantee that there will be demand tomorrow uh, when they've invested in it. So you need to provide that certainty, and these mandates, uh, you know, show that the government is committed to um, making sure that that demand will persist. So that's a key uh, element, uh, both in order to induce these efficiencies as, as the scale increases and to have learning by doing and you know, achieve all those benefits. Um, a second aspect has been that the mandate it only goes so far. Right? The mandate can only say that you have to blend 10% or 20% with your biofuel, but really if you want to go beyond that, then um, uh, you know, you have to have uh, you have to have this uh, biofuels be competitive in the market. So, if you want to go with you know uh, E85 or E100 being consumed, then they have to be competitive for consumers. Now, no government can tell me as a consumer that I have to buy a certain type of biofuel, right? When you go to the gas station, you should have you have free you know full freedom to buy whatever gas you want. Um, and in order to do that, you would only do it if you see that the price is comparable. If you find the cheaper fuel is gasoline, then that's what you would buy. So at the gas station, you have to make sure that these two fuels are competitively priced. And one way to do that is by raising, you know, taxing gasoline, making it more expensive, and making ethanol cheaper. And so you could do that with sub a subsidy and a tax, uh, which is what had been done in both of these countries. Um, but in addition to policies that are on the supply side to make you know, biofuels competitive, you need demand side policies because going beyond a 10% to 15% blend requires flex fuel cars. So we have to encourage people, consumers, to, to change the vehicles that they're, uh, you know, that they're using. Um, and so you know, that's both sort of demand and supply side policies, making biofuels competitive and creating this demand for, for higher level uh, blends is, is critical. Okay. So let's turn a little bit to what's been done in India. Okay. So again, in India, a major motivation has been the fact that there's growing demand for transportation. I mean, as you observe, you know, more and more people have cars on the road and are driving. And so demand for, for, uh, for petroleum products has been shooting up and our consumption, our production capability, which is the blue line, has been fairly stagnant. We have a very small share of the uh, reserves of oil in the world. Uh, and so our imports of petroleum have been going up very rapidly. And until recently when the price of oil was increasing, that put a real burden on the economy because we were, you know, spending a lot of foreign reserves to purchase imported uh, petroleum. Uh, and a third reason is, of course, finding high-value alternative uses for sugarcane. So, of course, sugarcane is, uh, follows this very cyclical pattern of production for a variety of reasons. And every six years or so, there is a surplus, and the price of sugar uh, you know, crashes, and then it picks up again, and so on. Uh, and so currently, we're in one of those crashes where the price of sugar, sugarcane and sugar is low. And so uh, the government you know, provides a lot of subsidy to sugarcane producers. Uh, if we could find alternative uses for it that would keep the price of sugarcane high, that would uh, you know, benefit the sugar uh, producers as well as the government. And so, um, uh, and, and so the idea is that can we find a better use for, for, for sugarcane? Uh, 
Uh, molasses is the byproduct of sugarcane, and uh, and the, it's being currently, you know, it's used in, in, uh, entirely for alcohol production in India, portable alcohol, and also for cattle feed. And again, its price fluctuates a lot as well because it's linked to the to production and price of, of sugarcane. So molasses could be. Um, you know, used as well. And so the biofuel policy in India was that they said, well, we're not going to use any food crops, which makes sense uh, because of the food security concern. Uh, and even when it comes to ethanol, we will not produce it from sugarcane juice directly, but only from molasses. Because the idea was that, well, molasses is a byproduct. It doesn't compete with food. Uh, if at all, it competes with alcohol and uh, cattle feed. And so, you know, we, we can use molasses. And it's Many years it's surplus, so you can use molasses. So we started a policy in 2003 when when uh, sugar cane prices were very low, and um, they introduced you know five percent. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it actually mandatory. It was more like a target, a goal to have five percent blending uh, in a few states, about 13 states, and then that was expanded to about 20 states in 2008. Um, it was to be made mandatory in 2008, but uh, it's never really been made mandatory. So there's no penalty for not blending. It's more like a, a desire or a goal to be achieved. And the goal is to get to 20% blending by 2017, um, you know, uh, for ethanol. Uh, now, in addition to this, this, the government also decided that they wanted to fix the procurement price for ethanol. So, uh, so by 2008 or so, they fixed it at 27 rupees per liter, and they decided that it should be 20% lower than the price of gasoline at that time. Um, since you know that policy actually did, did not work, and so in 2013 they said, well, we need let the price of ethanol be determined by market forces. That uh, and so the price has, uh, you know, the oil marketing companies have offered prices between 38 to 54 rupees a liter. Uh, they haven't gotten enough supply that they wanted. Uh, currently, they're offering to pay 44 rupees per liter, and again, the supply just doesn't seem to be there at that price. Okay. So, where are we currently? The, the policy currently is only being implemented in about 13 states. Uh, the blending rate is about 2%, so very far from our overall goal and potential. Um, you know, the ceiling price of 44 per liter really just doesn't get enough production going. And um, the government has a proposal that they would bend, they would fix the price of ethanol again in a way that it's an average of the price of producing ethanol at the refinery and the cost of gasoline. So try to balance and spread the pain a little bit to both the refinery and the, and the oil producers. Uh, but you know, as we sort of talk in a minute, it, it's unlikely to work as, as they would like. Um, and so only about you know, half a billion liters were blended in 2014. Um, there's just not enough supply. Instead, in many years, the uh, you know, sugar mills prefer to export their molasses to European Union countries. And they prefer to export their ethanol instead of blending it and selling it to the domestic producers of oil. They've been exporting it to Africa. So market forces are really important. If, if they are going to get a higher price for molasses and ethanol uh, by exporting it, that's what they would prefer to do. And so when the government fixes these prices, they actually create a disincentive for domestic uh, you know, production and consumption. Okay. So uh, this sort of shows the uh, increase in consumption of transportation fuel in India. And the, uh, uh, India is a big consumer of diesel for you know, our trucks and all of that. We use heavy consumers of diesel and relatively uh, small share of it is, is, is gas and petrol. So petrol is the smaller bars at the bottom uh, and then diesel is, the, is at the top. And so based on that, you know, really if we look at 2017, uh, roughly about less than six billion liters of ethanol would be enough to get to a 20% so six billion liters is like um, something like uh, one and a half billion gallons. You know, so if you think of where the U.S. is, it's 15 billion gallons. Uh, Brazil would be producing something like 10 to 12 billion gallons, and and in India we're talking about one to one and a half billion gallons would be enough to you know. So it's a very I mean when you talk about 20% blend, it's not a whole lot of ethanol. It's just about one to 1.5 billion um, gallons. 
So what are the key challenges to produce it, this 1 to 1.5 billion gallons? Well, if we want to do it with molasses, which is what the current policy is, the problem is that the molasses production depends on sugarcane production, which, and sugarcane production depends on the demand for sugar. So demand for sugar is limited, right? It's, there's only so much sugar the world can consume, and if you're going to, you know, you're not going to produce uh, sh sugarcane just to, or you're not going to produce sugar just to produce molasses, right? Because if you produce sugar uh, in such a large quantity, the price of sugar will crash if you try to sell so much sugar in order to produce just the molasses. Uh, the second problem is that the price of, of sugarcane and molasses fluctuates with the seasons, and, you know, with, with time. And, um, and so the government, when it fixes a price of, say, 27 you know, rupees a liter, it bases it on the assumption that molasses will cost 100 rupees a ton. And then, um, you know, the price of molasses goes up to 5,000 5, rupees a ton. And the cost of producing ethanol from molasses goes up five times. So, uh, so nobody would want to produce ethanol when you're going to get only 27 rupees um, per liter. Right? So that's the problem with fixing these prices. Um, and the, the problem with the OMCs is that they don't really have a binding mandate. So if, they, if the price of ethanol is more than the price of gasoline, they have no incentive to blend. Um, and so, um, you know, because there is no tax credit and there is no penalty for not blending, so why would they do it? Okay. Uh, and then the third problem is that when you start diverting molasses uh, to ethanol production, you no longer can use it for alcohol. And alcohol production in India is heavily subject to import duties, so we want, don't want to encourage alcohol imports. And there's very high uh, import tariff on alcohol. And so the price of alcohol will go up. And um, you know, and so either then you have to start importing alcohol, or uh, you know, you face that trade-off over there. So, the, in general, over time, you know, in, on average, you can say that it it may be feasible to meet about a five percent blend using just molasses. But if you want to go beyond that, then you have to start producing it using sugarcane. Um, because if you try with a, you know, so this is a study that was done um, <coughs> um, by some people at IFPRI, and basically said if you want to meet the demand for 10% uh, blend with just molasses, you would have to double the amount of sugarcane area that is currently there. So currently, the left graph shows that in 20, you know, this is up to 2008, but roughly about six six million hectares of sugarcane in in India are being used. If you wanted to do a 10% blend, you have to go to almost 12 million hectares using just molasses. Okay? And that's obviously not very practical to double sugarcane area. Uh, you'd have to reduce the area under rice and wheat, and that'll cause all kinds of um, problems. So, um, so we did a study, and we wanted to look at well, what are what is the more uh, you know from an economic perspective, an optimal way to meet the 20% blend target in India. And uh, we wanted to see what should be the optimal mix of molasses and sugarcane ethanol, or sugarcane to produce it. Uh, what is the trade-off that's between the use of molasses for ethanol versus using it for industrial or portable uh, alcohol? And how much land would need to be diverted? For which crops would you divert it? And in India, the other major issue is that unlike Brazil, in India, sugarcane production is largely irrigated. In Brazil, it's all rain-fed. There's no irrigation needed. But in India, it's largely uh, uh, irrigated, particularly in Maharashtra, where much of the sugarcane is being uh, produced. So that means that not only are you taking land away from food production, but also water. And that could have some implications. Uh, and then uh, another aspect to consider is there's a lot of variability in India with, across different states and regions in producing sugarcane. Uh, and so there's a question of where should you really be producing the sugarcane? Uh, and then lastly is what is going to be the cost of ethanol that comes out of when you use sugarcane and you know, how do we uh, price it? Okay. So if you look at this, these sort of maps, and you know, the maps are a little bit outdated and all of that, but, um, uh, but